<laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's great to see uh, such a big turnout again. So thank, thanks for, for joining us. And uh, uh, before I introduce our speaker today, I'll just run through the speakers that we've got lined up for the next few weeks, which is Patrick Field filled out quite nicely now. So uh, uh, next week, we have Miles Silman from Wake Forest University in North Carolina in the US talking about the future of biodiversity in the Andes and Amazon. Uh, the week after, a uh, last minute edition, we have a certain Yad Vindamali uh, talking about captured sunshine. What can an energetic view of life on Earth tell us about nature, decline and recovery? So en ecological energetics and, uh, and what it tells us about ecosystems. Uh, the week after, we have Tim Smith from the Eden, the founder of the Eden Project, which is quite a well-known project in Cornwall, on the transformative art of kissing frogs. <laughs> and then the week after, we have... Uh, Edith Hammer from, uh, I think, Lund in Sweden on soil ecology from the microbial eyes view. So we have a very different uh, a set of talks over the next, the next few weeks. So do, do come along. And there's, there's further ones later in, in term as well. Uh, so uh, turning to today's uh, speaker, uh, Elena Lazo Chavero. She's a professor and researcher at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México uh, since uh, 1992. And she's a coordinator of leading authors of the values assessment of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Sciences, or WIPA. So she's played a key role in, in that in really important uh, assessment that came out uh, 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 last year. Uh, and she has an interesting background of doing an undergraduate degree in biology and then a PhD in social anthropology. So she transcends the, the biological and, uh, and social sciences uh, in her work. And she's been a professor at the University of Zurich, the University of La Sorbonne, and the University of Montreal. And she's been here since September, and she's here until next week, I believe. Yeah. So it's the last chance to, to to catch up with what she's up to. And so, and after our talk, as usual, if you if you're new here, we have drinks around the corner. Uh, come uh, come and join us for an informal conversation after the seminar as well. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you, and uh, thank you for the invitation. And also I want to thank uh, Table uh, Debates uh, that they invited me to be here in part of my sabbatical year. Um, well, this time I organized uh, my talk in these five points. No, we will be going into the organic and fair trade products, into the land tenure, uh, but also arable land, degraded land, deforestation, monocultures, and what this, you know, the, the constitution of the spaces of capital to finally uh, go into the food and territorial justice. So my leading questions were this, um, that it is enough to really be eating organic food or even fair trade products. And these are leading us to really uh, food justice or territorial justice. Or which are the challenges no, that uh, really could take us to achieve food and territorial uh, justice? So what about organic food? No, um, Well, uh, the certifiers, no, as you know, there has been a big business about the certification of organic food. And now there are certification of the, certifi of the certifiers. And also it is, well, what is organic really about? No, uh, now it is called the mega organic, the ultra organic, the super organic, no? Mm -hmm. The US uh, organic, no? Because every certifier has their own logic and their own rules to be certifying. But also it is what not to buy organic, what to buy organic. And really it's so confusing also for the consumer. So, well, uh, at the beginning, yes, it was a counterculture movement, no, that it was really taking us back to earth to have a healthy food and uh, certainly to be uh, cultivating without agrochemicals. No? After really, no, the publication of Rachel uh, Carson's book about the Silent Spring, that it's always under no, the organic uh, production. But what has become about that? No, we have uh, all the certifications from the 70s and it's very much complicated and it, it is complicated for us. It is more complicated for small landowners or for indigenous people around the world. 
So what it should be, it is that organic uh, farmers, they have to stick to the standards, no, to really uh, what the label established. So they have even to, to follow like a code of conduct, no? For example, Nestlé has little, <coughs> like uh, a sequence of what to do and how to do it, not what to do. So there are really strict uh, rules about it. And also what we know it is that there has been a lot of cheating and disagreements of what organic should be or how it should la be labeled. And it has been a growing market about it. No, and we know uh, that they, they call it like the failure in the system, no, as the capital will be naming it. Uh, but we know that, uh, that precisely no, all the corporations are now having a business from the organic uh, production. And even though there was uh, private labeling no, to Walmart and to Costco, and it was not even no, labeled by the uh, national uh, certifiers. Even no, the CAFOs, that is uh, the concentrated animal feeding, no, the feedlots, what we, we know them, they were having no, this uh, labeling about organic beef or organic poultry. No? When we know that they are this uh, type of feedlots, no? that they are uh, concentrating uh, a lot of animals without any uh, health and uh, without any um, yeah, it, it, human and non-human uh, really uh, well-being. So now there's a lot of new labeling, no? Uh, regenerative Organic uh, Alliance, the Real Organic uh, Project. Now it is a real, real one, no? Uh, and so we, the, the poor fruits, no, are now, they are uh, have to be labeled as natural, as organic, as non-GMO, uh, et cetera. No? But uh, what we have to consider, it is that there is a lot of money there and there are fortunes to be made, no? Only for the organic uh, market in the US, there were around $21 million uh, only for one year, for 2021. And when we see where is this distributed, uh, are really farmers getting a better living out of it or not? And even though the fair trade market is really reducing food injustice, when their principles really were poverty alleviation, uh, they were, of course, environmental conservation, no food safety. But what we see more and more, it is that there is no poverty alleviation, even in those places where it is supposed that they are having fair trade agreements with different companies. Uh, when they have not uh, their own food safety and when we see a replacement of their staple food by the cash crops that they are supposed to be handing in into the big companies, no, that they are uh, having the, the fair trade agreements, uh, that it's supposed to, to be in education and women's empowerment, but when we see this, they have done really very little on these terms. So in this sense, we are like questioning about, well, what has been the consequences or what are the benefits of this fair trade reducing um, uh, social or food uh, injustice, no? And even, no, the Rainforest Alliance that uh, you, uh, <laughs> you, you know very well, that it is in around more than 60 countries that they have a very strict certification program that they are fostering the regenerative agriculture and now even the climate smart agriculture, no, whatever that is, no. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that of course, no, what they promote it is the good news is that Rail Rainforest Alliance knows what needs to be done and and uh, we are doing it, no. And that is the problem that they think that they are uh, thinking that they are doing it well. Uh, and when we see in the communities, in the local communities, that they are really no, controlled by the uh, Rainforest Alliance certification program, that they have to uh, be cultivating in this way and not in other way, that they have to go into this cash crop and not the other one. So then the question it is, what is happening no, in, that, in the context? What is happening in the local, and when we buy a fair trade where we can feel well in the sense of, okay, I'm contributing, but what we have to ask, it's a little bit more. What is about in that region that this product is coming from? So in that sense, we have to, one of the big question, it is 
what's about the land tenure and the land uh, the land rights? What is happening in the world? And what we see is more and more land grabbing by all type of companies and corporations, not only the ones of monocultures that we know, no, but also the ones that are promising organic products, no, for the global north, uh, the ones that are promising wood that is certified, no, and then they are saying they are reforest or they are uh, making plantations. So in that sense, land tenure, we have to think about them in this sense that who holds the land, who has the right to have access to the land for the length of time uh, and under what conditions. And that is so important to give stability and to give certainty for uh, the farming, but also, of course, for the farmers. And then it is very much related to food production, to food security. If I am very unsure about my land, then of course that takes us no, to a food insecurity. If really I am very unstable in the land, right, then that gives me no, um, more um, conditions of risk of, of really not having, not even for uh, subsistence, no, for having my livelihood uh, uh, really no, in, in, yeah, with, with welfare terms. And of course, also the land tenure, what it's giving us, it is a reflect of the organization of the economy, of how that society is producing, which are the contractual relationships in the rural areas. No, who is, uh, who, 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 whose uh, stakeholders are there and how are they making all their networking? And that also reflects us, of course, the spaces of power. Are there negotiated? Are uh, displacement of people? You no, know, because of not only the monocultures, but because of the land grabbing or the green grabbing. You no, know? how about all the conservation areas that has been uh, making you no know, the displacement of uh, a lot of uh, indigenous and uh, peasant people? But not only what we have to analyze is the land tenure. But also it is, well, what kind of land are we having access to in the sense of it is arable and how is the quality of that arable land? Because then what we see, it is mainly you know, that the monocultures are in the best quality of land in the plains and the staple products or indigenous people are in very mountainous regions where there is are problems of degradation of soils. So then the, the, the big question is then who no, and how is this arable distributed? Who has the access to this land? And to understand all the institutional arrangements that have you no know, um, been ruled in that context, in that country, to understand how then arable land is distributed. In the world, we could see that uh, they give us this uh, percentage of point, uh, well, of this uh, yeah, uh, result of uh, 0.19 hectares per person, no, but we know, no, that uh, it can be from 0.04 to 1,000 hectares, no, because there are uh, a concentration of arable woodlands in very few hands, and what we have, it is all the other, the mountainous lands that they are very much, you know, uh, scarce and very much distributed in uh, the population. So then, what we have to talk it is to understand why and how uh, has happened the uh, degradation of the soil of the land. Who has been provoking it? No, because many times it is we say, oh, no, there are the small holders that as they are very intensively working their land. Is that so? Or it has been more in the hands of these monocultures, corporations, no, that they have been fostering the monoculture, impulsing the monoculture, and using a lot of agrochemicals. And then afterwards, as they were leasing this land, they go out, and then afterwards, it's a return to the to the peasants or to the indigenous people. But this has been already uh, with the high uh, grade of um, uh, degradation. So what we also see in this map, you no, know, about not only how it is distributed the degraded land, it is these geographies of power, you no, know, in the sense of how it is decided, you no, know, or how why some countries are more degraded and in which parts they are more degraded. 
And when we come with deforestation, it will be in the sense, uh, the same sense. Um, we have to understand well the environmental institutions, no, that come into the agreement or the negotiation of forest conservation or forest deforestation. We have to distangle, no, disentangle all the arrangements of power relationships to really understand why, in which periods have been high deforestation rates, and in which other periods there are less deforestation rates. So we understand these pressures, no? And in which moments there is more pressure than in other ones. And also to understand that many times, no, when we see one of the maps of how it is recovering uh, the forest in US, for example, that it's in the, in the very green um, in this map, no? That we have uh, very like dark, uh, deep, uh, dark um, uh, green. And well, there are reforests, no, in the US, for example. Yeah, but uh, then why they are importing so much wood from Mexico, no? And uh, why are they importing so much wood from Central America or from Guatemala, no? Uh, without any certification. So then it is the big contradictions there, no? And then also, again, we have to understand them as geographies of power, no? Who is deciding, and it is a geopolitical issue to understand why, how uh, the deforestation rates are more important in some countries than in other ones. And to understand that why in the US or in some parts of Europe, there are reforests, no? but they are sending their uh, timber companies to other parts of the world and they are leaving from that non-certified uh, timber that is coming from the global south. So when we are talking about the Amazons that everybody is really you not know, very much worried about the Amazon and you will have a talk about the Amazon, so I'm not daring to talk very much about it. But what we see, it is there are a lot of uh, contradictions among the stakeholders. And now you know, with Lula, that was, uh, he recognized that he will be recognizing the titles of the indigenous people. That has been a, a big gain. But now it is the how are they going to make it? And because no, they were not really titles about all this land. So it will be a very complicated way, even though that politically it's a game. No, it is something that is important and um, it is like a triumph and many of the indigenous people in the Amazon are happy about it. But, but now it is the how and the why, no? Uh, yeah, the how. <laughs> um, so in that sense, no, what we also see it is, well, the, the land grabbing in the sense of the monocultures, no, that they have been going uh, uh, to the global south. And also here you have it, no, uh, with uh, big uh, high yield, looking only high yields with um, big soil degradation, with uh, looking low input uh, prices, no, that also they, it's favoring the big uh, agricultural corporations, um, that more and more it is uh, the use of agrochemicals. No, we were uh, promised with the GMOs that the pesticides will be, or the herbicides will be reducing. What we saw now it is no, it is, uh, they are increasing even, no, and the GMOs have not solved the problem about the pest resistance. It's on the contrary, there is more pest resistance. And what it's very important for uh, in this case, it is the replacement of staple crops by the commodity products. So what is happening in many of these countries you know that we are producing for exportation and we are importing our food. You no, know? and that is what is happening in Mexico with maize, in the sense of, well, we were the big producers of maize once, no? And nowadays, no, with, because of the NAFTA, no, the North American Free Trade Agreement, um, there were a lot of, no, uh, uh, unfortunate price and marketing uh, relations, uh, power relations that uh, took us uh, really to make the importation of maize because it's cheaper to produce it in the US than in Mexico. Because it's not considering no, the cost of production, they are considered other things, no? And of course they are massively producing it. So then what we see, it is all these NAFTA or those trade free agreements, what we are um, suffering from that, it is all the commodity products that are 
uh, being imposed in uh, those lands. So what it is it for many of the geographers, no, and uh, Harvey especially, it is understanding these different patches, no, that it's producing uh, the capital, no. So what we have to understand is all these rules of the capital accumulation in order to understand our history and why our geography looks like it looks, no. And how this um, uh, capital accumulation is producing also very big differences. It's not producing an homogeneity. It's producing a big heterogeneity in the sense of rules, in the sense of um, different ways of um, acquiring control of the process, of the food process, of the agricultural process. Uh, and also, no, producing these niche markets, no, these new markets that uh, we could say new places to colonize and the organic, no, the agro, uh, ecological, um, and now the regenerative uh, agriculture, that it's colonizing, no, all these uh, uh, new patches. And it's always, no, looking, of course, uh, the growth and not matter uh, the environmental or the social consequences. So, well, uh, about the, the last slide, uh, no, even no, in, in this, the, the left, uh, we see cattle raising in Veracruz, in, in the south of Mexico, no? So how it is determined the patchwork of rainforest or, or of uh, the, the spread out of the cattle raising? And this will be very, very much similar to all tropical Latin America, no? Colombia, uh, past that history also, uh, Brazil, in the sense of that cattle raising was the mean of land grabbing. No, it is the status that gives me the control of land. So more cows I have, more spreading of the uh, in, on the land over the land I have. And uh, when we see all, all the patchworks, no, and, and we see, for example, the mountain that it's behind the, the, um, the ranch of, of this person, we see you now that even you now in the high mountains, uh, the rainforest has been uh, fell down. So what we have to really understand it is, yeah, how this capital you no know, accumulation goes after and and it's eating you no know, the forest. You no, know? there is a a very nice book. You no, know, there's um by by a French anthropologist that it's on a manger la forêt. You no, know? and it's true. You no, know? it's we have been eating and eating uh, the rainforest. You no, know, because of these land grabbing of cattle and uh, of, uh, of land. And in the other side, what we have, it is the agroforestry um, systems, no? And with uh, the coffee plantations. And even there, what uh, Harvey will be saying, it is also there, it's the capital, no? Because they are controlled by the market. They are controlled by the prices. Even, no, they are controlled by the fair trade that arrives there, no? As Rainforest Alliance that are working with many coffee producers in Mexico, but that they have to follow, no? Their orders, their control, and they are substituting the maize by um, the coffee plantations. And then afterwards, I will come to what it's doing Nestle, but well. So all these decisions made over the territory gives us no, these, um, that we have to understand in how is the flow of power, no, how it is circulating the power, who is who in that moment, and it's, it's changing, it's very dynamic. We have to understand that these relations are very dynamic, that many times they are expressed by domination, but at the same time, it can be expressed by persuasion and sometimes they can be negotiated. So it is not one way of going, no, it's, but always it is in all the ways no, that uh, the capital will be entering and will be controlling the territories. And of course, the, the, the stakeholders, no, they are many, no, I, I only stated some of the global institutions, even World Wide Fund, no, for example, or transna big, uh, transnational or corporations as, as the coffee, as Nestlé, for example, that it's in, in very much in Veracruz in Mexico, the big bingos, no, the NGOs, uh, but also, of course, 
the farmers, and there is also heterogeneity of farmers. They are big farmers, they are small farmers, they are farmers that are having uh, a stability with their land tenure, but they are other ones that know, they are always are renting or leasing, no? So then what we have to understand, it's all this patchwork and how do they communicate or how do they negotiate over their territory? And uh, well, as uh, you have imagined, no, I'm using all the Foucault and the loose um, uh, ways of understanding a power, no, and understanding this uh, spreading of power in the spaces of uh, of capital. So then, what we have to understand it is that this uh, causes a lot of vulnerabilities in the local regions. Uh, these uh, vulnerabilities are expressed in social environmental vulnerabilities as well as political vulnerabilities and uh, where people are really you know, pressured by taking or by, ma by making uh, decisions. First, you know, what we said for, uh, about um, the recognition of, or not of their land rights. And this makes a very unstable or a very uncertain uh, panorama. No? Uh, so how people is solving or they are solving their problems with um, the agrarian structure. And this creates a lot of um, non-possibilities or possibilities of uh, producing their own food, no? producing their food for consumption when they know that it is even more expensive sometimes to produce them themselves and to go to the store and buy it. No? But that that brings a lot of food insecurity. Uh, and of course, that they are dependent no, on the cash crops to make their income or to make their uh, subsistence. Then this play between the cash crops, the staple crops, uh, crops uh, the forest conservation, they are always no. Uh, pressed uh, or under this pressure. And um, it is not easy no, to solve it when you are in the subsistence line. No, We will be like, well, if there were big landowners uh, that uh, they could subsist and they could move from place to place, that would be different. But when you are a small hold, uh, landholder and you are with no so much pressure, then of course you have to decide in the immediate. No, you cannot be like saying, oh, in my future, in 20 years, I will be doing this and that. No, they have to be solving day by day, you no know, year per year, their own subsistence. So also, no, this is uh, very much to consider in this um, sustainable or not sustainable livelihoods and how do they balance you know, their capacities and their assets to really meet their, their daily food uh, production. And of course, also there are a lot of gender imbalances that also we have to deal with. Uh, and many times when we are working with uh, small you know, landowners or with small farmers, what we are trying always is to incorporate uh, women in the discussions but no, there is a long history of gender displacement in the sense of gender margination. No? So it is not easy to really uh, make it no, through all these cultural vulnerabilities no, where always men have been deciding not only for the family, but for the land. No? And uh, many times uh, in Mexico, as in all Latin America, uh, there were first men that they were migrating mainly to the US. And when they were returning, perhaps with a new family, then the local family was displaced. No? So then you have a lot of uh, social and cultural problems about inheritance. No? It's uh, women that stayed there, that they were working for 10 years, perhaps that land, and where the husband is returned, or the, yeah, the, the, the ex-husband will be returning, then what will be happening with those lands? No? So then there are a lot of um, problems and very um, no, contradictions. Uh, and this is the very much in, in this gender imbalance process. So what we see also it is these vulnerabilities no, that are accumulated in the history what we have it is what we call it recursive crisis in the sense of 
when there is a recovery, perhaps, no, of the family or of even the community in the sense of recovery in, in uh, the, the cash crops, perhaps it was fine with, with a coffee, for example. But then afterwards, ha it happened something, no, a drought or a flood or you know, COVID, for example, it was very important and, and very decisive in many of the local populations, no? And then they bring it back, no? It is always with this image, no? Of Solicon in the sense of, uh, I am, no, uh, high, uh, hiking the mountain and something happens, I, 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 I fell down and I go back again, no? It's in the sense that uh, small farmers are always in this recursive crisis, no? And with all these vulnerabilities, then it's very difficult for them to really you know, overcome in the long term um, their, the structural you know, dimensions of all vulnerabilities. So when we are trying to understand why uh, yeah, peasants are producing like that or why they are uh, deforestating or why not, or why they are choosing to go in that way or not in the other way, uh, we have to understand these historical you know, decisions, these uh, historical and institutional factors that are taking me into uh, recreating you know, these inequities and these inequalities. And of course, here I'm, I'm using you know, the terms of Amartya Sen you know, about vulnerability, about social equality, and thinking you know, that it is this accumulation of vulnerabilities and of inequities that makes it you know, very difficult for uh, small uh, landowners to overcome uh, a crisis as uh, a price uh, you know, shoot or, or something that's happened with the prices or something that happened with the market. You know? For example, with COVID, some of the markets were closed and only this fact you know, took again you know, a recursive crisis that led to the peasants, no, a very much no vulnerable uh, situation. So, what we see now, for example, no, what is happening in Veracruz and in many regions in Chiapas, also of Mexico, it is that the shaded uh, coffee, you no, know, that is produced under agroforestry systems, um, they have the problem with the roy, you no, know, and uh, well. Uh, it is not so clear, although there are some experiments that uh, the roy it, it grows more under the shaded coffee than the um, sun exposed coffee. No, but uh, that has been unclear. But what it is happening now it is that Nestlé is obliging you no know, the producers the the, far, the coffee growers into you no know, the coffee plantations with no shade. And now what we are having, it is this landscape, no? If before we have it like in agroforestry with a high biodiversity, no? And, and a lot of uh, yeah, bird uh, biodiversity, no? What we have now, it is, well, the clearing of all the trees. No? And this is, no, what Nestlé is obliging in order to buy their organic coffee. So even though it is an organic coffee, no, and we could buy it as a fair trade uh, product. What we see then, it is all these pressures that are behind. And this is no, in, because of the power structure and because of their vulnerabilities, no, their accumulated vulnerabilities that of course the peasants are obliged then to go into the non-shaded uh, coffee plantations. But also, you no, know, when we see the cattle distribution, you no, know, one of the biggest uh, feedlots in Mexico is Sucarme. Uh, it's a Mexican big feedlot, you no, know, that uh, started in Sinaloa, that it's in the north uh, east, uh, northwest of Mexico. And what we have there, it is they started with uh, cattle production, and more and more they are controlling all the market. You no, know? they are controlling more or less like 70% of the beef market. So they are exporting it mainly to the US and it's 65% uh, of the exportations are to the US, but also to China, to Japan, to Middle East, uh, uh, et cetera, no? But what it is behind there, no? It is that they are buying you no know, very uh, young cattle. And uh, so all the feeding, all the fattening will be in the feedlots. So now, for example, that I am in a project about 
yeah, cattle raising, if it is sustainable, no, not, I, I am very doubtful, but well, what we are trying to do is this agro pastoral systems, no, in, in Veracruz. And what it is important to know it is that, well, afterwards, the destiny of these young cattle, we don't know, uh, even though it's, it's supposedly that there is a traceability. Uh, well, the traceability will be that they are in a feedlot and then afterwards, no, it will be exported perhaps to the US or to China. And where even that it was produced as no environmentally friendly, um, we uh, really lose a trace of that, of a traceability, no? So then what we see then, it is also that sukarne has been growing a lot, no? And it is surprisingly a lot, no? I can tell you. So in that sense, what we discover, it is there is a lot of illegal cattle coming from Central America, and all this illegal cattle is controlled by the narco cartels. So when we are supposedly, and then we say, why Sukarne, if no, all of a sudden grew, they grew really so, so rapid. And well, there are suppositions uh, that you were, yeah, <laughs> you, you can understand which type of suppositions we are uh, perhaps thinking of how and why Sukarne grew so much. No? But then in that sense, what we are saying it is, okay, this commercialization and distribution of cattle, when perhaps we are eating something that is coming, no, a, a good beef in your plate, well, we don't know really uh, if we are paying to the narcos or not. So <clears throat> when we have cattle raiser or when we have that tobacco, for example, in, under, no, um, the big industry of the tobacco companies, also corporations in, in Veracruz, or even if we have an agroforestry system, we are recreating vulnerabilities because of the how market is imposed, why and how the prices are imposed. No, for example, the bananas, no, that here are so cheap, and I cannot explain myself why are so cheap here in UK. No. So in that sense, why and how the market establishes those prices, and even in our agroforestry systems, and we can buy it as an organic. Um, banana, then what we have to think it is why and how this market and prices are pressuring you know, the small landowners that perhaps they continue that way and perhaps the day after they cannot continue it and they can I have to sell their land. And then that is what it's happening you know, about land grabbing or land leasing. You no, know? And in that sense, it is an accumulation of land in other hands. And also what is happening, and this is particularly in Mexico, but also uh, in Peru, now I was in Ecuador, uh, also in Colombia, all this food and cultural dispossession. Um, in Mexico, we eat the grasshoppers, and it was since pre-Hispanic times, uh, it has been dated now, and it has been part of the culture to eat you know, uh, grasshoppers, in, in the season of the grasshoppers. You can see you know, here that they are cooking them, uh, they are eating in a family, they are selling it in the market, no? But then now, no, it has become uh, a very fashionable and very uh, hipster you know, food. Mm -hmm. So now it is entering the gourmet uh, restaurants. And now, you no, know, the the grasshoppers, they are very, very expensive in the sense that before they were so cheap and they were like a, a protein you know, for uh, poor people. And it was always like, oh, yes, it's it's the future uh, for for food and, and for uh, alleviation of poverty. Then now we see that you no, know, it is becoming more and more expensive. So now it is you no know, because of the pizzas that they are making for um, the, the hipster uh, you know, um, public or for fancy restaurants uh, in Mexico City or in Oaxaca City, you know? and also you know, the, the pulque that it was from the agave. You know? uh, uh, um, it, it's also now becoming you know, in a very fashionable way. So then to be coming to the end, what we have, it is when we see these maps of food insecurity, 
what we have to always think and to relate it, it is with other you know, aspects. And um, there is a, a recent uh, uh, publication about land tenure and the networking of the land tenure. And what we see then it is, okay, there is a relation between land tenure and land use, of course, with deforestation, with indigenous population, and of course, with food insecurity, no? So when we are thinking about what type of production are we having, it is like to relate it always, no, to these land tenure uh, and land rights problems, with these um, vulnerabilities or the accumulation of these uh, vulnerabilities and equalities, and then to understand how are functioning all these relations of power in a, a territory. But well, I think there is a hope, no? And uh, the hope it comes when we are always in networking with the people uh, that we see that there are a lot of interests no, of uh, communities or of collective action of what we can change, what we can do. And uh, there is always like this discussion of how can we uh, really have a healthy food? No, uh, as you know, uh, Mexico is one of the countries that has problems of uh, obesity. Uh, it's the first country with a problem of children's obesity. And uh, no, many times it's because of the refreshments and of uh, uh, the Coca-Cola that you might have seen it in the photo of that they are eating the traditional food, but with the Coca-Cola besides. And this, no, it's also the product of all the transnational corporations that were into uh, the, the food system and that they have controlled the food systems. No? Now, uh, with the new government, we had a lot of discussion about the taxes to the refreshments once again. No? And it is always a negotiation and a domination of taxing the refreshments. No? But it will be you know, the solution to really tax them so much that then uh, people will be you know, not uh, encouraged to uh, drink it and better to drink water. No? But as you know, also in many of the communities, it is cheaper to buy a Coca-Cola than to buy a liter of uh, water. No? And the uh, pollution of water has become such a problem that now you cannot drink it as here, no, of tap water. But uh, then afterwards, you fall into these big contradictions between uh, the yeah, the use or, or the consumption of consumption of, of uh, refreshments or of water. So in this sense, uh, what we have been working, it's to bridge you know, alliances, uh, to bridge alliances between local authorities and uh, perhaps restaurants or uh, with farmers, with indigenous people, and to try you know, to combine to make it uh, yeah, at, at least you no know, discuss it in uh, in the schools to discuss it uh, among uh, women or among farmers and to come to solutions and to come to proposals for uh, the uh, national authorities. So as conclusions, I will say, well, we will have food and territorial injustice when we still have you no know, very uncertain land rights or land tenure when we have degraded lands and we are not really investing in the recovery of all these degraded lands, uh, that food is seen as a commodity only and not as a way of living, no? And uh, the production in Mexico of the milpa, for example, that it is this corn exists, no polyculture, uh, it is a way of living. It was a mode of living, no? And it is not only the food to be consumed. Uh, so uh, in that we have no this uh, displacement of staple food by uh, cash crops uh, and no how uh, uh, the national governments are also imply of course in taking or or in in moving all these no uh, decisions into uh, a monoculture for example or accepting that Cajil, Monsanto, Singenta will be taking over the territories of uh, so uh, many peasants or indigenous people. So in the mean, in the sense that if local peoples or local communities and indigenous people are not deciding over the territories, well, we will be having this injustice, even if it is a fair trade 
product or if it's a fair trade crop. No, uh, what we have to really be working with them is what they want, how to decide, how to open all these uh, possibilities of democratization and uh, making decisions over their own territories. And of course, what we have to build are and to you know, really correlate it is the environmental with the agrarian and the food policies. Because if we see them in a separate way, as always, you know, that the food policies comes in one way and the agrarian in another way and the environmental policies are you no know, separated from that, it is the big problem. I think that we have to bring them together and to be really, really you no know, deciding with the local uh yeah peasants and with the local indigenous populations to be localizing you no know, not really making homogeneous you no know, uh, policies but really to be working much more at the local level so thank you very much Thank you very much. You can open up to questions. Hi. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for for this amazing uh, presentation, uh, especially coming from Mexico as well. It's really nice to see someone um speaking about our our country because it's not very usual in this part of the world to talk about north america <laughs> because that's another thing that um um many people they think that mexico is south america which is geopolitically not true so it's really nice to to see this this work um here in this part of the world uh but i was going to ask you if you can uh explain further this entity uh, that we have in Mexico that is very peculiar to Mexico, uh, the ejido and the communal land, because uh, that maybe will explain better uh, why it's uh, necessary to take uh, decisions at a local level and why it's uh, very specific to each region in Mexico, because how they need to organize themselves as ejidatarios or as a communal land owners. Mm -hmm. I go one by one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you very much for this question. Um, yeah, it's a very peculiar uh, land arrangement in Mexico because of uh, we have a revolution in 1910. So after the Mexican revolution, because it was a peasant revolution asking and demanding for land, uh, they decided to, yes, proceed into a reform, land reform. This land reform took a lot of time. It was not immediate, no, as we could have imagined that in 1917 already, you know, were a lot of land distributed. On the contrary, it was very, very slow because it was against the interest of very big and powerful el agrarian elites, no? But finally, when we have some decades, no, in the 30s, we have a lot of land distribution in some in the 50s and 70s. But there was, uh, on the contrary of the rest of Latin America, a land distribution. And the figure, no, the agrarian figure that was um, issued from this Mexican revolution was the ejido. And we call it ejido to a part of land that it was fought by the peasant and was attributed by the national government in their use. No, You can use it, you cannot sell it, but you can use it. It is an usufruct no? of this land. So then that is the way the peasants and indigenous populations acquired or could have access to the land. Now, what it happened now, it was in 1992, there was another land reform that it was what we call it the counter reform, no? Because now it was the privatization of that land. In the sense there was a program of certification of land, and this was to give security to the landowners. But what had on the contrary, it is that before uh, the assembly of the community were the ones that they were deciding like the big issues of the land, no problems of each community. 
And nowadays, the that these assemblies, no, these community assemblies have lost a lot of power because each ejidatario, no, each person that is owning the ejid part of the ejido can decide to sell their land or to lease their land without the permission or without the authorization of the uh, assembly, no? So now it has become really, um, yeah, in a risky situation, no? That before it was always controlled by the community, their lands. And now with this reform of 1992 and the declaration of the end of the land reform, then it has become really problematic, no? So now, for example, mining companies can come and say, okay, I buy you your land and then four persons can decide for the community, no? Because they are their lands and then are issues, uh, political issues that are much more complicated. But in that sense, it is no, uh, the way of, um, yeah, uh, now a very risky situation. But uh, what it is important then, it was that for many years, no, the ejidos had like a stability in the sense of having their land rights as a community. No, even though there were problems with the land reform institutions and there were, pro but more or less, no, we could say grosso, that they were having no the usufruct, the use of the land, and they could decide upon their land, not selling it, but. Yeah, cultivating on uh, yeah their, their lands. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very insightful, and I think you gave a very clear context of all the pressures that local communities and indigenous peoples are suffering in Mexico because they are on many fronts. So I'm wondering, like on the environmental side, like also you touch a little bit about the impact of international organizations in the decision. Uh, process within the community. So what is your thought about now, since the government has been um, reducing the investment in environmental, like uh, we had very good programs in Mexico, the, the National Forestry Commission, they had like very amazing uh, forestry programs to support that uh, empowerment of the communities, but then it has been reducing and who is taking control or who is taking advantage of that are international organizations. Mm -hmm. So we'll see more and more in recent years, like international organizations come in with money, mm -hmm. but that doesn't get to the ground. Yeah. So it, it gets just at the administra administration level, but it doesn't really get, so that now there is like a, a lot of social conflicts within in, in uh, communities because there is like this mm -hmm. uh, power dynamics of with whom you will work. And if you don't work with me, so there is like a, a lot of coercion also like in collaboration, mainly with the National uh, Protected Areas Commissions mm -hmm. with these international organizations. So what are your thoughts on that sense? So what we can do as an academic sector to change what is happening or to influence what is happening because we see more and more like appropriation of local projects and mm -hmm. local initiatives by these international organizations yeah. thank you yeah thank you yeah you touch a very neurologic point no in conservation and um yeah what is the future of um of forest no and rainforest in mexico i think it's a catastrophic uh, situation no with the new government in that sense that have been reduced, as you say, no, all the programs that were supposedly no very impulsing and fostering all the programs of conservation of uh, of forest and rainforest. No, so what I think it is um, that uh, for an academic, I think that we have to fight against that, no, and to really be very much in the front. Um, yeah, if not accusing, but yeah putting in the air you know, what is happening in the environmental uh, issues and, and the conservation and that what it means for the appropriation of forests. No? Because afterwards, if you know, all the big international uh, corporations or the bingos no, will be controlling that land via you no know, carbon bonds or a red plus or whatever, you no, know, then what we commit is that even less and less um, power, no, the, the ejidatarios or the community holders, no, will be having for their lands, to defend their lands and, and their wishes, no, in the sense of what parts to be conserved and which parts to be work and which parts, yeah, there is no, like, yeah, decisions in their own frame, no, yeah. 
So it is like, yeah, to be putting this in, in, in the discussion, no? Okay, thank you very much. Hi, right, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, really impressive work. And and you touch upon something that I'm very, very interested on is, is kind of this interaction between the communities, um, the, the land they have, but also the impact of the drug cartels. So for instance, I know there is a lot of uh, a tremendous impact on the production of, of avocado, much of which actually comes to, to Europe and to the, to the UK, but also lemon, which is a really precious product, uh, not only in Europe, but also in the US, for instance. But I don't, I don't see, I haven't seen much about how this impact is being quantified. To what extent do we know how much these drug cartels actually dominate uh, uh, this, this production? So I know, I know from family that I have around Michoacan and Guerrero, some of the states, uh, they know which drug cartels dominate uh, and ask them for money actually to be able to actually work their, their own land. Uh, so do we have any mechanism now in place, any quantification actually, uh, that we can use to actually know who is dominating what and, and how much money is being moved around uh, and dominated by these, uh, these cartels. Mm -hmm. No, we don't have that information. We have the information that, um, no, the avocado is controlled by the narco cartels uh, and only by interviews, no? Um, when we have been interviewing big producers of avocado, what they have been always telling us it is, well, I prefer to pay to the narco cartel than to the police, because at least I know that my product will arrive to the US. No? And even they have very sophisticated ways no, to introduce the avocado in the US no, with holograms. And, you know, they, they have documents and papers that the narco cartel is given to the producer, the producer is you no know, taking it into well. The, the truck driver will be taking the, this uh, uh, authorization of the narco cartel, and they will be showing it, and they will be showing it into the border. So when they say, uh, "Why the U.S.?" Uh, the U.S. is implicated in that, and they know, of course, that the narc that it's a product that it's you no know, surveyed or controlled by the narco cartels, no. And there are huge you know, amounts of tons that comes uh, that that go from avocado, for example, but also the berries, no? And it's also in Michoacan, no? That also they are controlled by the narco cartels. And as I said, no, to carne it is controlled, and 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 the cattle that is coming illegally, no, from Central America, also they are controlled by the narco cartels. And this is known. Everybody talks about it, but in your house and not no in publicly because yeah you you put your life in danger no so i think that no there are no quantifications i don't know anything about it but through the interviews you see that it is a very complicated and complex way of how the cartels are dealing with this no and that is why well the control of the areas and of the products no of lemon of avocado are in war no because they mean, yeah, huge, huge amounts of of, of money, you know? But no, I don't, I don't know. Every, there are a lot of studies that have been saying uh, the berries, uh, the avocados, uh, the cattle, you no, know? but not in a quantification way. You no, know? I don't think that even, for example, sucarne, it's very highly protected by the government, you no, know? by the national and by the state uh, of Sinaloa. They are giving prices, for example, no big national prices because they have been the greatest no exporters of cattle. And you say, how can he, they have a price, national price? No, then of course the national authorities they know about it because it's impossible that they have been growing so so uh, quickly, no, in that and that they are having these feedlots in Michoacan, for example. They have a huge feedlot that I don't dare to go there even, no, because I'm scared about it. But then you say, how can they survive there if they don't you know, deal with the narco cartels? So for sure they are dealing with them, no? Uh, thank you very much, yeah, echoing uh, everyone else. Um, I was wondering if we could just take a step back slightly and building off the, the comment about Ekido's four, 
Um, I've been doing some reading a little bit about how uh, Canada have been changing their Indigenous um, land recognition mm. system. And I just wondered if you could give us a broad strokes uh, framework, I guess, to understand how land tenure systems change. Is it always a legislative change? I mean, we've mentioned revolution. Is there an easy way to understand how it's happened around the globe and through history, or is it too complicated? Mm -hmm. I think that we have to understand it contextually, no region by region, country by country, because, for example, what is happening in Mozambique, you know, that there is a lot of land grabbing and a lot of Indian uh, companies, land companies that are buying uh, land in Mozambique. It is incredible. Or Brazilians, even big um, cattle races, Brazilian cattle races are buying land in Mozambique to say why, how and how it how it is happening, no? So I think that what we have to analyze always the land tenure is context by context, no? Because also, for example, the pastoralism, no, where pastoralists are living and all the uncertainty of their land rights, no? Now they are in Cambodia, for example, that they are very, very much um yeah grabbed no their land because of course they had extensive land and then they cannot prove that it's their land no and then easily they can say no this is your land and not all of this no that that is what happened very much in mexico before because when you had it all the rainforest and it's not only mexico or latin america it was worldwide forests were considered unproductive spaces no they were there without being produced it's anti-progress no what we have to do it is to come into the progress and change all this forest into productive lands and then there were transformations but there was also a law that was also around 1920s no for example in mexico that obliged the ejidatarios that if you are working your land you have to prove that you have been working your land and the way to prove it it is to be cutting all the forests and I'm working my land because if not, I will be in risk that the agrarian reform will take away my land because I'm not uh, working it, no? So that is why there was a joke among biologists. They said, oh, I prefer that people will be very, or um, very lazy or that they will be drunk because that's the way that, that, that forest rainforest can be conserved, no? Because there was this law that it was really not uh, uh, pressuring the peasants to be proving that they are uh, working their land by yeah, converting or transforming all the rainforest into uh, yeah, productive lands, no? So I think that uh, the case of Mexico is special because of the ejido and, but also it is very different in different parts, no? For example, in this part of Sinaloa in the Northwest, that there are very big um, uh, maize producers, no? But also horticultural producers that are producing very much for the US market, the horticultural products. Uh, they are leasing land. What they are always saying it is, no, I am not interested in buying land because there are a lot of always problems of invasions. Uh, there are problems of that I will be, you know, as I need a high yield and I am using a lot of agrochemicals, I don't care, it's not my land. After 10 years that it's not usable, then I turn to another land. So they are leasing and leasing a lot, but it, complete ejidos, no? And it is, this, for example, we have very little data about it. And only when you go and said, oh, how, how much land is leased here? Oh, I don't think he looks here. How come to this person? Yeah, okay. No? So then, but that doesn't happen in the South of Mexico. No, that happens very much in the Northwest of Mexico. No, so then you have a lot of patchworks and differences about land tenure and land rights. No. And also the recognition of indigenous population, no? Uh, I was thinking also in Cambodia or in Laos, no? Where they are not even recognized indigenous people. So they don't have the right to have lands because they are not recognized as uh, indigenous populations, no? Um, so this is a bit of a, I guess, speculative question, but... Um... Given all these issues that you've told us about about um, land tenures and all that in Mexico, um, if you sort of, if you, for example, were the president of Mexico tomorrow, um, how would you try and reform the uh, land tenure system and sort of trade agreements and all of that to try and fix these issues? <laughs> yeah, it's a nice question. 
<laughs> ah, yeah, better to dream than not to dream, no? <laughs> um, well, first of all, I will return that the, yes, the community assemblies will be having the decision, no? That they will be really making the decision institution of, um, yeah, of your territory has to be the community, not one by one, as it was before, for example, in, in the Ejido system, no? And also in the communal land, land holdings, no? So in that sense, it is to give back, no? The power to the assembly. And even though it doesn't like means that that will solve the problems, no? Because also there are a lot of contradictions and power relations and manipulation. Of course, they, all these things, we know it, but at least, no, there is more opportunities that the local people will be deciding over their own territory and not that other ones or, or the companies will be deciding over their territory. That is one thing. And the other thing it will be, yeah, what um, you were saying about the, the forest legislation, no? That nowadays uh, it is very, very little budget to all the conservation programs and to the forest management programs and to the community forest management programs. There is really very, very little budget and little interest, no? It's, well, the environmental thing is this at the least of the important things, no? So then, and it is with this mind of progress and, and still, no, transforming all the forest and to, to, to make progress at the nation, no? So that has to be stopped, no? And that has to be reverted and to say, well, how can we really find other uh, alternatives? And I think that there are alternatives. There, is, there are organizations, um, very strong indigenous organizations in Mexico that have been saying, no to the mining, no to this, no to that, no to the monocultures. We will be keeping these, but they are the fewest. No, they are not uh, so, so much because it needs no a lot. They, they are 40, 50 years that they have been organized and they are no trying to. But even no, um, the, the Zapatista movement uh, in Chiapas, no? now they are crossed by the narco cartels, no? and they were having a lot of success in the coffee production. They were having success in, no, yeah, in 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 what they thought that they were the the principles of of food justice and of uh, territorial justice, but now they are crossed by violence, by the police, by the narco cartels, by the by everybody, no? So then it is a very difficult situation, for example, for the Zapatistas, no? Okay, there's an online question that I'll like to know, and we'll see. This is from uh, Natalia, and she asks, uh, trade has been driving many of the changes in national policy, as you showed, countries like Colombia are net exporters are also far from food sovereignty. So current policies such as bioeconomy seek to increase the share national resources have on GDP, which risks the exacerbation of these, these trends. How do you think we can approach these challenges? Mm -hmm. would, it, would a bioeconomy make us more vulnerable? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think first, um... To be working on the land rights uh, and um, to be working on the local institutions to give um, possibilities that the local communities will be deciding over their own territories. But if we don't work in these institutional no, arrangements, no, the local institutional arrangements, we certainly we are not going to advance in saying no to Nestlé, no? Because of course with Nestlé and they are promising that they will uh, buy your product, even though they you change everything, but you are saying, yes, I will do it because if not, I won't have uh, an, another market, no? And if I don't have security for another market, I will be doing what Nestlé does. But that is because, no, also they are not, yeah, well organized, no, that the peasants are not well organized, that they are individually, no, answering to what Nestlé is deciding. And then, of course, Nestlé knows about it, no. And of course, uh, for Nestlé, it's not well that they are well organized. As for example, this big organization that I was telling you in Puebla, no, 
in Quetzal and that they are very well organized. They are coffee producers. And they can say to Nestlé, no, we don't want you. No, we have another market. We don't want you. But that is because they are very well organized. But in all other places where peasants and indigenous people are not organized, then it is very easily that the transnationals and their corporations will be dealing no, with individuals. And then it will be very easy for them to control their lands and, and their products and their prices and their markets. No? That is what I could say okay. about it. Any more questions? Short arms. <laughs> Uh, okay, thank you so much for, for being here and for this. Um, so Yedvinder mentioned your work with ITBES, and I know today we've been talking a lot about the key role of devolving power to local communities. Um, so I'm wondering how what your experience with ITBES has been like and what you think the relationship between something like a global level assessment or global governance is with something like devolving power and empowering local communities. If there is a relationship, yeah, yeah, yeah excellent question. You know, it it, it has been a um, a question that has been very much discussed in IPBS, no. And uh, what we had it is it was like workshops with indigenous people and with local communities to understand really how they were dealing with biodiversity conservation, with the values that they were giving, no. And certainly they were accusing no, all these big no, global decisions over their own territories. No? So you have also, for example, in Lapland, no, in uh, Finland and Sweden, they are very well organized and there are very young women that they have a lot of force. And then they come to IPS and they say, ah, no, no, you have to write this and this and this. And if not, we are not going to accept it and our government is not going to accept it no uh also the bolivian no we have a lot of problems with the bolivians in the sense of well we have to pass the the the, the document no and in the plenary the bolivian was saying no until you write mother earth until you write pachamama until you write that it's a cosmological also vision and it's not only this relation to nature as a commodity, no? So it was very strong. And for example, the Argentinian, that they have no indigenous populations, they were against it. And then how to deal with this negotiation, no? Because the Argentinian said, oh no, if you write that, I don't sign. And the Bolivian said, if you don't write that, I don't sign. So what do we do, no? So it was a process of very much negotiation. And at the end, of course, it is, softer of what we i was really know very much with a bolivian uh, person i was saying i agree with you but we cannot write it the way you want it because the argentinian the ukrainian guy the they don't want it like that written like that germany didn't want to write it like that no so then it is like to make yeah negotiations and then afterwards the document we could say it is a softer document and it doesn't have the force that indigenous people would like to have. But in the other, on the other side, what they say is, well, it is better than nothing. And at least, no, we are considering in, in all these discussions, we are considered as having other perspectives, and that was good. And to bring into the values assessment their own values and how they value no, nature. And to bring it into this assessment, it was important for them, even though it was not the way they would have liked that that was the result, no? Mm -hmm. uh, no more questions. Uh, thank you once again for that. For that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have drinks, uh, Richard. Um, and the Syrians just down there to the left and follow it. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, sometimes my English uh, is not, uh, no, sometimes I say, oh, <laughs> I should have said this.